Good morning to each and every one of you, wherever you may be. Well, it's morning uh, here in uh, New York City. As a matter of fact, I'm in Manhattan at the moment, uh, not at the monastery. I've uh, been here since uh, Tuesday, flew in from San Francisco, where I was uh, visiting the Paulist Fathers. That's my, the community I'm part of. And I'm here on uh, visiting some friends from high school. And uh, so we've had a wonderful time together so far. And uh, but it's glad to be with you this morning from uh, about a block away from uh, Central Park, 84th Street. My vocation did begin in New York City, but not in Manhattan. Uh, Terry Ryan grew up in the Bronx, and uh, that's the part of New York just north of Manhattan. And I was just the other day, I noticed something in San Francisco where I have a room with the Paulist Fathers, although I live in a monastery, but we're going to get to all that. I had pulled some things out of a memorabilia box as I was, was kind of cleaning out my and uh, there was a little uh, kind of, not a yearbook, it was an eighth grade little booklet that we had in which you could put in the uh, formal photos of various schoolmates and they could write little things in there, uh, little poems or hope that you have a good high school or have a good life or I hate you or whatever they wrote. It was cute, but there were two things I discovered. One, was I, they had a section where you wrote in your demographics and I had a 28 inch waist in the eighth grade. I don't know what happened to that. But the other thing, which was quite interesting was there were page that said, what are the three things that you think you might wanna be when you grow up? What is your first, second and third choice? My first choice was a priest. And I never remember putting that in. So obviously I was thinking of becoming a priest in elementary school, which uh, I often think of myself as a delayed vocation because I did not go into the seminary until I was 29, which back in the 19th and early 70s was an old man. Most of them went in in high school or college or 22 at the latest. So, uh, but I was thinking about being a priest that I would put it down as my first choice. Uh, and my second choice was a chemical engineer and I couldn't do science or engineering. And the third choice was an astronomer because I did like astronomy. And so if the first choice I did pursue eventually uh, and I was, I went to mass like other Catholic people and uh, I don't think I had a very remarkable high school in terms of vocation. I did remember, I do remember visiting a uh, seminary, uh, the Dossison Seminary in New York. And then I visited the Marinol Seminary, which was in Osney, a suburb of uh, where we were living, which was White Plains by that time. But I decided that I was not going to go in. I was going to become a runner. I was a runner in high school. So I had this delusion that I was going to be this great runner in college. And then I would go in. So it was still on my mind in high school, but not focused enough that I said, I'm ready to give it all up and go in. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I think trended through it all was I had a natural inclination to stillness and silence. Uh, although we just went back to my high school, this is part of our reunion, we went back to our high school, Stepanak High School on White Plains. And one of the first things the uh, person giving us the tour did was take us to the chapel, which was the same place it always was. And I recall I, I spent very little time there and it would have been a great place for silence and solitude because it wasn't used all that much at a daily mass, which I hardly ever went to because of classes and such. 
So, uh, and I thought you, you had this inclination and you, you, didn't, you didn't pursue it with your whole heart. And I think that was what was the delay. I didn't give my whole heart to seeking Christ in silence and solitude, but I had a natural inclination for it. What does that mean? I was not bored and I didn't feel like a loser or I should be doing something else. I was comfortable in it when I did it, which wasn't a whole lot, uh, but I went to uh, Fordham College and the Jesuits and my, my sense of the Jesuits is you don't get ordained till you're 32. You have to go to a lot of schooling. And uh, so I never thought about joining the Jesuits. And uh, I thought about doing good for the world, like Peace Corps or something like that. Um, but so I had that kind of inclination again, silence and solitude and being doing something other than having a successful business career and I figured oh you know we get married someday and so on but I wanted to do something to help others that was that was kind of grabbed me which uh, meant I wasn't going to go into uh, law school I didn't think or, I, I don't know so it was very kind of mishy mashy and uh, so not being sure I just went on to graduate school to uh, get an MBA at Columbia and then went to work for uh, business organizations. Our first job was in Chicago, recruited for the oil company. And uh, I found myself asking a very profound question. What is the purpose of my life? Why am I here? And I actually asked several of the uh, employees that I was working with or young men, youngish men to me, they were maybe in their forties, I was in my early 20s, mid 20s, they were in their 40s, late 30s, even 50s. And they were fulfilled working for an oil company. And I was thinking, who cares what gasoline you buy? Gasoline is gasoline, a tire is a tire. Uh, but I poured myself into it. In other words, it wasn't, I, I really worked hard and developed a uh, credit card advertising system and coming out with credit cards back then shows how old I am. And uh, I developed the advertising for it, which they liked. Uh, but I had that question, what is the purpose of my life? And uh, I wasn't coming up with an answer, but I was occasionally going to the local church, either the cathedral where I lived or the church behind where I worked and would go to some midday masses at times. I rarely went on weekends, but I went midday sometimes. And Mike's just sitting quietly in church. And I remember those two years in Chicago, two of the worst winters you could possibly have, which I found out was normal for Chicago, which is why I left. That I went to a uh, Catholic bookstore. They had, actually had a Catholic, Chicago is a very Catholic town. Went to a Catholic bookstore that uh, was not on the normal path that I went to. and. I found myself looking in sections that had to do with uh, meditation, spirituality, as opposed to history, catechism, theology, philosophy, things like that. I was just found myself attracted to that section. And there weren't very many writers back then writing about silence and solitude. I mean, Thomas Merton was, uh, was doing some things, yes. Um, and a couple of others, but I, I see on the spine of a book, something that would say silence, solitude, and this word contemplation, meditation, and in the Catholic section, I was attracted to it. Eventually looked at other things like Buddhism and Hinduism, which had much more on meditation than the Catholic church had. So uh, I remember picking picking up a book, I can't remember which one it was, but just that sense of attraction to that, but not putting the two together and saying, well, don't you wanna be a monk or something or a priest and uh, any case. So I moved to California. I did talk to a priest about life and he turned out to be a Paulist priest that I met there because the Paulus had a church right behind where I worked. And so I met this fellow and I remember sitting down and being impressed by the fact that he was asking the same kinds of questions. And he was ordained about a year or two 
what, what kind of a priest am I going to be? But at least he, he didn't come across as this guy with all the answers and so on. He came across as a real human being. And I had not really, even though I went to Stepanak and met priests, they were teachers, they were just authority figures. This fellow was not. And uh, he was only three years older than me. So I was attracted to that kind of, oh, priest who seems like he's asking important questions and not coming up with the answers, uh, which I think was part of Thomas Merton. <coughs> you could ask questions and you could sense the struggle he would have trying to find out what was important, what's not. So I moved to uh, San Francisco and uh, <laughs> I got a job out there, was recruited and in much better weather, I tell you. And uh, so, and what's the church up the street from me? A Paulist church up from where I worked. So I found myself again, same questions, different corporations. This is a big paper company. What's the purpose of my life? Who cares who buys, whether you buy this toilet paper, that toilet paper, paper's paper. People were really working in the corporation to get ahead, move up. They weren't asking that question. They had other questions. They were not mine because I was not married, didn't have kids, wasn't trying to finance a house or anything like that. Uh, and uh, I ended up going up to the mountains uh, after that job lasted about 14 months and just living in Lake Tahoe. And I think I was a waiter, or bus boy or uh, something like that at a restaurant uh, run by a Catholic guy. And uh, I guess he liked that I was Catholic, not that I went to church at all. And uh, I remember then sitting down one day and saying that question, what is the purpose of my life? And say, why don't you read the Bible, Terry? Why don't you start with the Gospels? Uh, I knew enough of that from all my Catholic education and the first Gospels, Matthew. So I figured I'll just read the Gospel. If something doesn't make sense, I'll just continue on. It wasn't going to be a Bible study. I was just going to read it and see. What's Jesus Christ going to be in my life? Do I believe this stuff? Or what am I? Am I going to really be a Christian? And if I am going to be a Christian, let's be one. If not, forget it. And in other words, settle this. And uh, I got to chapter 11, verse 28 to 32. Come to me, all you who uh, are, come to me, all you who are weary. Come to me, who are burdened. It hit me. That's exactly what I felt like. Weary and burdened. Come to me as you are. It was a revelation to me at that time. This was 1971. My experience, my sense before that was come to me if you shape up. Go to confession. Get cleaned up. Then you can go to communion. Get worthy. Or I'm not going to have much to do with you. And this gospel didn't say that. Say, come to me, all you who are weary and find life burdensome. And that was exactly what I was. I said, take my yoke upon you, burdens light. And I said, I can come to Jesus just as I am, a mess. And I said, that is good news. And that was, and it was a white light experience. Even the room began to light up. I've never had a religious experience like that since. And that was my white light experience. And that was going to be the center of my life from now on. I wanted to talk to people who were not squeaky clean. I wanted to talk to people who felt alienated, left out, uh, not good enough, uh, who felt God didn't care. And those are the people I wanted to talk to. And that's who the Paulus fathers talked to. Uh, and uh, so I got in touch. I went back and I did some work with a, uh, it did, I didn't jump on being a priest, but I said, I want to tell somebody about this. And well, who does that? Priests. I said, oh, no, because then I felt I was a little too old. I was 27. I said, yeah, I'm not really that good a guy. Uh, I know mean, God loves me, but uh, they don't want me to be, no one wants this guy for a priest. But uh, so I said, oh, what are you going to do? Sit around and talk, talk to yourself about be a priest, don't be a priest. Why don't you go talk to somebody? So I went and I talked to this Paul's father who seemed happy being a priest. I don't want to talk to anybody, you know, angry and mean-spirited and yelling at people. Uh, I don't want to talk to those kind of people. This guy just seemed happy being a priest. I said, if I'm going to be a priest, I'm going to be happy. Uh, 
uh, I wasn't ready for any crosses, let me tell you. So he was very enthusiastic about me applying to the Paulist Fathers, even though I felt like I was kind of old. So uh, I did. And uh, I, I kept trying to back up, I can't do this, I can't do this, until another light went on. And it was, you don't have to decide to be a priest, Terry. All you have to do is decide to give yourself a year at a time. I said, I, I can do that. So I think it was God working on me, taking me where I was. I couldn't decide. It was a five-year program. I couldn't decide to be a priest in five years. And I couldn't decide today at that moment to be a priest. But I could go a year at a time. So I said, I'm going to go a year. I'll give myself a year. And I'll see how I feel. I never thought that they might throw me out. I said, see how I feel. And then if I think I'm still OK, I'll go another year. And that's what I did for, for, for the five years, little by little. And uh, so I became a priest. And uh, but again, I found myself doing something that other Paul students seem to be interested in, and that is sitting quietly in chapels. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I would call it any formal meditation. I found myself just sensing a comfortable presence with God, doing nothing in a chapel. Uh, I wasn't so much reverencing the Eucharist in the tabernacle. I wasn't big on exposition of Blessed Sacrament. I wasn't big on novenas, devotionals, saying rosaries. Uh, that just wasn't where I was at. It was just sitting quietly in the presence of, without having any sense of what else that might be. And I wasn't thinking about becoming a monk uh, at all. And so I became a Paulist priest. And, uh, but within six months of getting out, uh, an ordination, I discovered a book on a shelf and uh, it had to do with si the other side of silence. And back then, now it's 1977 or so, there were still not a lot of books in English about silence and solitude. The Other Side of Silence by an Episcopal guy named Morton Kelsey, who was put out by the Paulist Fathers. And I pulled that book off the shelf. It was because we used to get a copy of Every book that came out of Paul's press was sent to each, each of our parishes. And I began reading that book and it really struck me. And I even took a, a, a retreat with Morton Kelsey someplace in some monastery. And it was just, and he's married, and wife and the kids and everything. And he's really hooked on this. And I said, this guy is like me. I'm getting, I, this is important. And he said it was important to him and he used to get up sometimes in the middle of the night so he wouldn't disturb his wife. He went and he sat on the toilet seat because it closed the door because there would be no light and she could continue to sleep so that he could sit and meditate. And I heard well, meditation is what contemplation is, the other side of silence, the depth of it all. Not that I was there, but I was attracted to it. And so I uh, kept on with that and uh, ran into a Trappist monk in Boulder, Colorado in 1981. I was then assigned to uh, uh, the Paris St. Thomas Aquinas, which the photos, by the way, went to at that time because the kids liked us. And uh, so I was going to, uh, I was there for six years where I ran into this Trappist monk named Thomas Keating, never heard of him. I didn't know that much about the Trappist. I'd been to a little Trappist retreat in college. I hated it, the crummy place, cold, food was terrible. Uh, but I ran into him and I said, gee, this guy's really got it. And uh, so I met, went, met him up at Stonehouse Trappist Monastery, I think 1984, and interviewed him for some stories for a radio station I was doing programs for in Boulder. And uh, went up the next year and again spent another week there at the monastery. And, uh, but, it was January each year and it's a too cold. I wasn't thinking of becoming a monk, even though he invited me to work with him and what he was doing in contemplative prayer. So no, no, I'm a Paulist, like a parish work. And uh, I went on to, uh, after that to San Francisco, but I came back in 91 to take a 10 day retreat. Keating by this time had developed these 10 day contemplative prayer retreats around something called centering prayer, which is a method of, it, you know, it's a way to help you. and. By then I was starting to practice uh, myself uh, 
And uh, so I said, uh, I'm an active Paulus priest and I'm doing this sitting or kneeling in contemplation or contemplative or silence and solitude, let's just say deep meditation, sometimes not even that, but I was at least attempting. And I uh, went up in 91, 10 days, and I asked the abbot, could I come back someday and just spend a longer time here? And he said, sure. So uh, that was 91. I think uh, 13 years later, after I buried my parents, I came back for a summer. And I really liked it. So I asked the Paulus if I could come back for a second summer. Ah, one summer more. So I came back for a second summer. Really liked it. And I was still living in Boulder. Now I was at Sacred Heart of Jesus because the Paulus left uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. But I stayed around. So um, now I'm at Sacred Heart of Jesus working there. But that uh, pastor was a nice guy, Father Bill Breslin, very nice man. We got along. And I said, I'm going to be up at the monastery each summer. He said, I'm fine. I didn't bother to ask the Paulus. I just kind of went and said I'd be there. And they just, I don't know, forgot about me or let me go. I don't know. In any case. I'd go up each summer and then finally when, when, and I was really attracted to it. And finally when COVID hit, all my work died. Uh, there was no traveling, there were no teachings. And at, for a moment, Sacred Heart of Jesus had no masses, uh, but, and I was a little bit frightened. Uh, so I said, well, the summer's coming, I'm going early to the monastery, I never left. I mean, hardly left. I, so I really live there now, been there a couple of years. I still have my room in Sacred Heart of Jesus, but I find myself basically living in the monastery most of the time. And I still have my room in San Francisco. So I still do some things in each of those places, but basically my life is the monastic life. And, uh, and it really is attractive to me. So my vocation sees myself as not as a Trappist. I'm never gonna be Trappist. I'm gonna be a Paulist priest who lives and teaches now on Zoom. You don't have to go anywhere now. You can teach on Zoom. There's no, you don't have to get on airplanes and run around. Uh, and it's safe. It's safe for people who might otherwise be tempted to come to listen to you personally, especially if there's going to be an upclick in uh, COVID. So now and again, I can go teach in Boulder, do a couple of things in Boulder. But uh, basically, I my life is up here. Now, what does that mean in terms of your location? So uh, my Paulus part of this is, is still teaching about contemplative prayer, which is what the Paulus said, said I could do back in 2004, after I finished being a pastor and burying my parents. I said, I just want to teach contemplative prayer to all those people who have left the Catholic Church and joined the Buddhists and the Hindus because Catholic priests and catechists don't know or talk about this life that is very that we started in very many ways in the Western world. And I want to talk about it. Uh, let people know, hey, the Catholic Church has something for you if this is your inclination. And so it's still Paulus outreach to people around the periphery. It's very ecumenical. It's, it's contemplative prayer doesn't care what religion you're part of, very interfaith. Uh, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, you're going to be up at the Episcopal Church uh, in July, giving a talk, and there's probably going to be all kinds of people from every place in that. So I said, this is what the Paulist Fathers were about, our little small organization. So the, the, the monastic life is a life. In other words, you live that life uh, yeah. When you're a diocesan priest or a parish priest, you take days off. You have your work, and then you go do something else. Maybe you go play golf for six hours or whatever. The monastic life is a 24-7 life. People always say, why don't you come to Boulder and do this and that? Why don't you marry me? Why don't you bury this one? Why don't you baptize this one? I said, because I'm not living my old life in a different place. I'm living a new life in a different place. And the life is the actual 24 seven living of the life. And you don't know that until you actually do it. I can talk about it. I say, well, what happens? I said, whatever happens, happens because you do it day after day after day. And it's, it's not running away from the world. We have many of the same world problems. Your faucets break, our faucets break. Uh, 
your roof needs fixing, our roof needs fixing. You have to shop for food, we shop for food. You cook, we cook. So I cook, I bake bread, I bake desserts, I cook meals for the monks, I'm the librarian uh, for them. I take classes for that online, how to be a librarian, catalog books and so on and so forth. Uh, so I have regular jobs, uh, but because I'm there on a continuing basis, they have taken me in as part of them, as opposed to a guy who visits for a few months. They often have people like that, but some of them just say, you're not going to be part of my life. I'm not, I'm not putting myself into you. Uh, so they really include me, but their expectations are that since they invited me to live their life, I will live their life. And the reason I'm away so long, this particular moment, I've never been, it's a month, I'll be away a month, is I said to the abbot, who's really my spiritual director at this point, I said to the abbot, I wanna spend several weeks with the Paulist Fathers in San Francisco, which I haven't done in a long time, to see what it's like, to see what I'm like. They were the same guys as always. What's happened to me? And, uh, and how will it feel to be with them? And so I did. And I've learned from those experiences, uh, not looking to go and do that again for a long period, long stretch, because I don't really like being away from the life. In other words, it's, it's giving your whole heart and soul to seeking Christ at the center of yourself. Uh, it's not something for everybody. And you're not wrong if you don't have that interest. But if you have an interest in the silence, the solitude, the quiet, the stillness, and learning a method to take you deeper, then I would suggest that you, you know, don't let's become a monk, but pursue it on a daily basis. And over a period of time, your life will change. And you'll look back and say, what happened? How did that happen? It's called the Holy Spirit, as we all know. Your life changes. There's, I've met so many people who say they're Catholic and their life really never changes. But they do certain perfunctory rituals, but they don't change. Uh, they can be going to mass every week. And if they're judgmental, uh, impatient, intolerant, unkind, they continue to be all those things. They just go to mass and if they feel they've sinned, they go to confession, but they don't change. Change is interior. Uh, and uh, so I don't, and, you know, people, they try to ask, what most people want is a three minute answer to what is contemplative life about. There are no three minute answers anymore. It's a three minute answer to who is Jesus Christ. But uh, I'm encouraged because he did it. He grew up in a small town of Nazareth, an outback, uh, you know, like Erie, Colorado or something like that, an outback. And he used to go out into the desert. Now, I don't mean he went far out of it. He went out edge of town and he had to be safe. Caves were everywhere. And he could sit quietly with himself. There was something that brought that out in him. Not everybody was doing that. And uh, that's where he learned, I think, a lot of the, the depth that he had. Uh, and if he was truly human, he had to learn that he also was God and what that meant and what it meant was going to happen to him. Uh, and, but I'm encouraged by what he did and by John's gospel, which is the most contemplative, and the one you're hearing every day, and uh, if you go into daily mass and on Sundays, you notice that John's gospel is moving. These early Easter gospels were all about Jesus being present to them. Uh, so it's all about resurrection, believe in resurrection. Jesus is risen, Jesus is God. And so he's always present. But now these later gospels, he says, I'm not gonna be with you. And it, it's, and then it, it's just his teachings of love one another. That's what you're going to have to do. And uh, I find I can't love one another until I get out of my own way. And I've never been able to get out of my own way by being uh, an active uh, ministerial parish priest. Uh, I just had too much ego in it. Uh, 
uh, and that's just me. Uh, not saying it's everybody, it's just me. I did a good job. I was very helpful to a lot of people, but there was just a lot of unfinished me that's in it. So people say, well, how long are you going to be in the monastery? I don't know. How long is the monastery going to be there? There's only seven monks. So uh, uh, I, I don't have long range plans. Well, I'm 79. Who has long range plans at 79? So I don't have long range plans, but I, I'm not looking to leave uh, that kind of lifestyle. So I'll be up there uh, next, I actually fly back to Boulder next Tuesday, and then I hope to drive up there on Wednesday. And uh, I'm coming back to Boulder the end of June, I think the last Saturday in June, COVID permitting, and uh, doing another teaching at Jubilee Hall. So there might, there might be some of those, well, it's safe. Summer last year was kind of safe, so I think it's kind of safe now. And then COVID comes back, and we're all hiding out again. Uh, but even with COVID, COVID actually was what allowed me to go, what allowed me to give myself permission to take a step. I'm a, kind of a cowardly guy. I would not have just, I'm going to go live in the monastery. It was COVID that allowed me to take that step that I think I could have done many years ago. So always God has been inviting me to this life. It just took me a long time to get there at this step. So if you feel God's inviting you to this kind of life, don't knock yourself out for not doing it sooner. You do it when you're ready. God invited me, but I wasn't ready. Uh, I was a long time growing up, immature for years and years and years. And so I think I'm just saying yes to God's original invitation way back when, when I was a kid and my mother used to tell me to go out and play in the Bronx and I'd go out and there'd be nobody around. Uh, and sometimes I would just go sit in the church and I didn't feel lonely and I didn't feel like a loser. I didn't feel like I had nothing to do and nobody to play with. I was comfortable. I think that, uh, that uh, ordination was uh, a pretty powerful moment uh, for, uh, and I've talked to my classmates because we just had our 45th uh, ordination anniversary and I think that that was a pretty big moment uh, of uh, humility. It was, you really want me to do this? And the other thing is, can I really do this? I mean, if you, if you listen to what's going on in terms of what the bishop is doing and the symbolism of it all, I think uh, you know, that is very, very important. Um, I think another uh, highlight of my life that has uh, been, uh, which is one thing that I don't get to do in the monastery is I discovered that uh, one of your best gifts is one you don't know how you ever got. Because uh, then you know it really is a gift. I have a gift for children. I don't know what it is. I connect with children. Uh, children will go to a mass and uh, they've developed a way of getting through it. Uh, they, they, they check out, but they check out in a way that is, uh, they won't get disciplined. In other words, they don't act up so much. Well, sometimes they do, uh, but they find various ways to get through that hour because nobody's talking to them. Uh, they're being ignored. And even if the priest is trying to talk to them, he can't for whatever reason. I've never figured it out, but I've always had a gift for connecting with children. Suddenly they stop and look up and they are enthralled. And I don't know why. This is not something I get to do in a monastery. Maybe God said, okay, you did that for years, that's fine. But I'll have still people coming up to me and saying that their children were so uh, whatever, whenever I talked. And uh, I didn't have it in the beginning. I know that because when I was in the novitiate, we went and tried to teach confirmation class, which was ridiculous. We didn't know anything. I didn't have it then, but someplace it came after I was ordained. 
And I've always been able to connect with children. And I think that was very, very powerful for me because I never took any classes in it. I never studied it. I never tried to figure out child psychology, none of that stuff. It just always is. And I think a powerful part of it is I said, and maybe I heard someone say this, if you can talk to a four-year-old, everybody else will listen. And uh, I believe that. Look out at the congregation and say, who is here? And uh, connect with them. And uh, another powerful part of my priesthood that has come more than once uh, discovered is speak the gospel through your own life. Don't tell people what to do and uh, don't hide from them behind the gospel. In other words, you have your life, but you're not going to let them know it but somehow. I learned early on, talk the gospel through your own life. And a lot of priests don't like that. They don't want that. They want me to talk about catechism or, what, or rules and regulations or what you're supposed to do, or so on and so forth. But that never worked for me. And it was one of the reasons I, I tried to be a missionary and I wouldn't, priest, wouldn't talk to other priests about me because I would tell these ridiculous Maureen stories. Children remember Maureen's stories 30 years later. They couldn't remember what the other missionary talked about 10 minutes after he finished. Uh, and that was a gift. And those things I really don't do anymore in the monastic life. I said, okay, those are some of the things you've let go of. And I don't know if I'll ever work in a parish on a more full-time basis. Uh, so um, those are some things it wasn't, a moment, but it was a moment when I learned that and the light went on and I said, this is what I'm gonna to continue to do. Now, sometimes it really was ridiculous and it was a complete failure, but uh, every, every priest has failures in his speaking and talking and so on like that. So, uh, and I think that Thomas Keating, meeting Thomas Keating, listening to him talk in the first five minutes, I knew we had it. What does that mean? He was what he spoke. That's what you have to be, be what you speak. So I often speak about my failures and how I'm working with them. And people connect with that. Uh, rather than tell them you're a failure, here's how you be good. Connect with their failures. They wanna be good, but they gotta start from their failures. And that's a lot of what Thomas Burton was writing. That's a lot of what the contemplative life is about. You can't go to the deeper life until you deal with your failures and the depth of why you do these bad habits that you do. Why are you doing them over and over? And there's a, there's a root there someplace and you've got to get to that root. I hope, hope that helped.